America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the intersection of philosophical naturalism with paleoconservatism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. For today's episode, we will be looking at The Birth of Tragedy by Friedrich Nietzsche. This is the second book by Nietzsche that I've reviewed. I did The Genealogy of Morals uh, a few episodes ago, and that was one of his later works. This one, actually, The Birth of Tragedy, is his first published work. And uh, I believe he published this while he was still working at, uh, at a university. I don't recall which university it was, but um, this really was very different from the work that a lot of other um, philosophers and, and professors were putting out. And it was not well received uh, by his fellow professors. Of course, much of Nietzsche's work was not all that well received until after his death, but this one really kind of sets him apart from the rest of the crowd. I think it's a really interesting book. It kind of diverges a little bit from some of the things we've been talking about, but not too much. And this will let us look a little bit closer at some of the ideas of ancient Greece and uh, their not only their morals, actually probably not as much their morals, but their understanding of of reality, their understanding of art. It's very, it's very Much of the book is about Greek tragedy. Uh, this isn't a podcast about Greek tragedy. This is more of a podcast about politics and the psychology behind politics. But there are some interesting parts of this that we can maybe dig into to understand how the pre-Christian mind worked and how their uh, belief system, their religions, may have informed uh, their politics as well as their art. So the parts where he gets into a lot of detail about Greek tragedy and the format of it and how the format developed, I'm not going to get into as much. But the parts where he talks about the religion um, and how it shaped their understanding of themselves and their understanding of the world, those parts I'm going to focus on a little bit more. This is uh, got a lot. It's not a long book. It's like, oh, 140 pages this, this version, by the way, is translated by Francis Golfing. Uh, the translation is from... Well, this, this the, the translation was specifically for this book, which was published in 1956. Uh, the book was originally written in 1871. 1872, I'm sorry. 1872. So, like all of my episodes, there will be a number of sections that I will be reading aloud. Uh, I believe I have a total of six sections in here that I want to read aloud, and some of them are on the longer side, but I want to get in and really get into the nitty-gritty of what he's saying and what he what his point is so that I can comment on his points and his positions, more so than just to review the book as a whole, I want to tie it into some of the other themes that I've looked at in some of the other books, uh, and maybe we can sort of add this to the whole general scheme of the approach that I'm taking to to politics as far as uh, naturalism and paleoconservatism, the nature and the nation. So this will talk about the nation a little bit, and it doesn't talk about nature as much, but it does talk about the ancient Greek religion, which we can see in some ways as a natural religion. So, without any further ado, I'm going to get in here and start reading from an early section. This is from the first chapter, uh, when he introduces the ideas of the two gods of Apollo and Dionysus. Those two gods will constitute the uh, majority of the section that I want to talk about. I'm really interested in how he in his take on the god Apollo and the god Dionysus. So, in this section, he says, quote, "The fair illusion of the dream sphere, in the production of which every man proves himself an accomplished artist, is a precondition not only of all plastic art, but even as we shall see presently, of a wide range of poetry. 
Here we enjoy an immediate apprehension of form. All shapes speak to us directly. Nothing seems indifferent or redundant. Despite the high intensity with which these dream realities exist for us, we still have a residual sensation that they are illusions, at least such has been my experience, and the frequency, not to say normality, of the experience is borne out in many passages of the poets. Men of philosophical disposition are known for their constant premonition that our everyday reality, too, is an illusion, hiding another, totally different kind of reality. It was Schopenhauer who considered the ability to view at certain times all men and things as mere phantoms or dream images to be the true mark of philosophic talent. The person who is responsive to the stimuli of art behaves toward the reality of dream much the way the philosopher behaves toward the reality of existence. He observes exactly and enjoys his observations, for it is by these images that he interprets life, by these processes that he rehearses it. Nor is it by pleasant images only that such plausible connections are made. The whole divine comedy of life, including its somber aspects, its sudden balkings, impish accidents, anxious expectations, moves past him, not quite like a shallow play. For it is he himself, after all, who lives and suffers through these scenes, yet never without giving a fleeting sense of illusion. And I imagine that many persons have reassured themselves amidst the perils of dream by calling out, it is a dream. I want it to go on. I have even heard of people spinning out the causality of one and the same dream over three or more successive nights. All these facts clearly bear witness that our innermost being, the common substratum of humanity, experiences dreams with deep delight and a sense of real necessity. This deep and happy sense of the necessity of dream experiences was expressed by the Greeks in the image of Apollo. Apollo is at once the god of all plastic powers and the soothsaying god. He who is etymologically the lucent one, the god of light, reigns also over the fair illusion of our inner world of fantasy. The perfection of these conditions, in contrast to our imperfectly understood waking reality, as well as our profound awareness of nature's healing powers during the interval of sleep and dream, furnishes a symbolic analog to the soothsaying faculty and quite generally to the arts, which make life possible and worth living. But the image of Apollo must incorporate that thin line which the dream image may not cross, under penalty of becoming pathological, of imposing itself on us as crass reality. A discrete limitation, a freedom from all extravagant urges, the sapient tranquility of the plastic god. His eye must be sunlike, in keeping with his origin. Even at those moments when he is angry and ill-tempered, there lies upon him the consecration of fair illusion. In an eccentric way, one might say of Apollo what Schopenhauer says in the first part of the world as will and idea, of man caught in the veil of Maya. Even as on an immense raging sea, assailed by huge wave crests, a man sits in a little rowboat trusting his fail frail craft so amidst the furious torments of this world, the individual sits tranquilly, supported by the principium individuationis and relying on it. One might say that the unshakable confidence in that principle has received its most magnificent expression in Apollo, and that Apollo himself may be regarded as the marvelous divine image of the principium individuationis, whose looks and gestures radiate the full delight wisdom, and beauty of illusion. In the same context, Schopenhauer has described for us the tremendous awe which seizes man when he suddenly begins to doubt the cognitive modes of experience. In other words, when in a given instance, the law of causation seems to suspend itself. If we add to this awe the glorious transport which arises in man, even from the very depths of nature, at the shattering of the Principium Individuationis, then we are in a position to apprehend the essence of Dionysiac rapture, whose closest analogy is furnished by physical intoxication. Dionysiac stirrings arise either through the influence of those narcotic potions, which all primitive races speak in their hymns, or through the powerful approach of spring, which penetrates with joy the whole frame of nature. So stirred, the individual forgets himself completely. It is the same Dionysiac power, 
which in medieval Germany drove ever-increasing crowds of people singing and dancing from place to place. We recognize in these St. John's and St. Vitus's dancers the Bacchic chorus of the Greeks, who had their precursors in Asia Minor and as far back as Babylon and the orgiastic Sakaia. There are people who, either from lack of experience or out of sheer stupidity, turn away from such phenomena, and strong in the sense of their own sanity, label them either mockingly or pityingly endemic diseases. These benighted souls have no idea how cadaverous and ghostly their sanity appears as the intense throng of Dionysiac revelers sweeps past them. Not only does the bond between man and man come to be forged once more by the magic of the Dionysiac rite, but nature itself, long alienated or subjugated, rises again to celebrate the reconciliation with her prodigal son, man. The earth offers its gifts voluntarily, and the savage beasts of mountain and desert approach in peace. The chariot of Dionysus is bedecked with flowers and garlands. Panthers and tigers stride beneath his yoke. If one were to convert Beethoven's paean to joy into a painting, and refuse to curb the imagination when that multitude prostrates itself reverently in the dust, one might form some apprehension of Dionysiac ritual. Now the slave emerges as a free man. All the rigid, hostile walls, which either necessity or despotism has erected between men, are shattered. Now that the gospel of universal harmony is sounded, each individual becomes not only reconciled to his fellow, but actually at one with him, as though the veil of Maya had been torn apart, and there remained only shreds floating before the vision of mystical oneness. Man now expresses himself through song and dance, as the member of a higher community. He has forgotten how to walk, how to speak, and is on the brink of taking wing as he dances. Each of his gestures betokens enchantment. Through him sounds a supernatural power, the same power which makes the animals speak and the earth render up milk and honey. He feels himself to be godlike, and strides with the same elation and ecstasy as the gods he has seen in his dreams. No longer the artist, he has himself become a work of art. The productive power of the whole universe is now manifest in his transport, to the glorious satisfaction of the primordial one. The finest clay, the most precious marble, man, is here kneaded and hewn, and the chisel blown of the Dionysiac world artist are accompanied by the cry of the Eleusinian mystagogues. Do you fall on your knees, multitudes? Do you divine your creator? End quote. So that was a slightly longer section there, um, but he introduces Apollo and Dionysus, and he talks about dream and intoxication. So the, the function of dream, he associates with Apollo. He associates Apollo with illusion and the creation of form, the distinction of entity one from the other. Uh, he associates it with what he calls the prince, uh, principium individuationis, the principle of individuation and individuality, the separation of a self from others, to identify oneself as a distinct entity. And, uh, and so it's this sort of function of, of form-taking and, and illusion and separation and individuality. And then Dionysus he associates with intoxication. And this is the reversal of those same Apollonian functions. This is the dissolving of boundaries between um, one person and another. This is the loss of oneself, the loss of one's ego in ecstatic celebration. Um, it's the it's the oneness of all beings. It's the it's the he associates it with spring and the uh, blooming of nature and the return of nature into uh, into man's consciousness or into man's being. He says specifically. He says not only does the in in reference to uh, Dionysiac uh, ecstasy. He says not only does the bond between man and man come to be forged once more by the magic of the Dionysiac rite, but nature itself, long alienated or subjugated, rises again to celebrate the reconciliation with her prodigal son, man. So it's a return to nature, and it's a return to, um, to 
unification uh, between people. So these are sort of complementary and sort of contradictory uh, gods. Apollo building up separation and Dionysus eliminating separation. These two kind of competing forces in human psychology and also in human society and as, as artistic functions, if you will, uh, forces that express themselves through the creation of various forms of art. So now that uh, I've gotten that part, I want to I jump a little bit ahead where he begins to talk about uh, the gods in general, the, the creation or the invention of the Greek gods, what purpose they serve. Uh, and so in this section he says, quote, Whoever approaches the Olympians with a different religion in his heart, seeking moral elevation, sanctity, spirituality, loving kindness, will presently be forced to turn away from them in ill-humored disappointment. Nothing in these deities reminds us of asceticism, high intellect, or duty. We are confronted by luxuriant, triumphant existence, which deifies the good and the bad indifferently, and the beholder may find himself dismayed in the presence of such overflowing life and ask himself what potion these heady people must have drunk in order to behold, in whatever direction they looked, Helen laughing back at them, the beguiling image of their own existence. But we shall call out to this beholder, who has already turned his back, don't go. Listen, first, to what the Greeks themselves have to say of this life, which spreads itself before you with such puzzling serenity. An old legend has it, that King Midas hunted a long time in the woods for the wise Silenus, companion of Dionysus, without being able to catch him. When he had finally caught him, the king asked him what he considered man's greatest good. The daemon remained sullen and uncommunicative, until finally forced by the king, he broke into a shrill laugh and spoke, Ephemeral wretch, begotten by accident and toil, why do you force me to tell you what it would be in your greatest boon not to hear? What would be best for you is quite beyond your reach, not to have been born, not to be, to be nothing, but the second best is to die soon. What is the relation of the Olympian gods to this popular wisdom? It is that of the entranced vision of the martyr to his torment. Now the Olympian magic mountain opens itself before us, showing us its very roots. The Greeks were keenly aware of the terrors and horrors of existence. In order to be able to live at all, they had to place them before the shining fantasy of the Olympians. Their tremendous distrust of the titanic forces of nature, Moira, mercilessly enthroned beyond the knowable world, the vulture which fed upon the great philanthropist Prometheus, the terrible lot drawn by wise Oedipus, the curse on the house of Atreus which brought Orestes to the murder of his mother, that whole panic philosophy, in short, with its mythic examples, by which the gloomy Etruscans perished, the Greeks conquered, or at least hid from view, again and again by means of this artificial Olympus. In order to live at all, the Greeks had to construct these deities. The Apollonian need for beauty had to develop the Olympian hierarchy of joy by slow degrees from the original titanic hierarchy of terror as roses are seen to break from a thorny thicket. How else could life have been born by a race so hypersensitive, so emotionally intense, so equipped for suffering? The same drive which called art into being as a completion and consummation of existence, and as a guarantee of further existence, gave rise to that Olympian realm which acted as a transfiguring mirror to the Hellenic will. The gods justified human life by living it themselves, the only satisfactory theodicy ever invented. To exist in the clear sunlight of such deities was now felt to be the highest good, and the only real grief suffered by Homeric man was inspired by the thought of leaving that sunlight, especially when the departure seemed imminent. Now it became possible to stand the wisdom of Silenus on its head, and proclaim that it was the worst evil for man to die soon, and second worst, for him to die at all. Such laments as arise now arise over short-lived Achilles, over the generations ephemeral as leaves, the decline of the heroic age. It is not unbecoming 
to even the greatest hero to yearn for an afterlife, though it be as a day laborer. So impetuously, during the Apollonian phase, does man's will desire to remain on earth. So identified does he become with existence that even his lament turns to a song of praise. End quote. So that's a little sort of a challenging section, but he's basically saying that so there was this myth of King Midas hunting Salinas, which was some sort of a stag, I believe, that was a companion of the god Dionysus. And upon capturing, capturing him, he asks what the what man's greatest good is, what's the best thing for mankind. And and this uh, creature, this this uh, magical stag, says to him that the best thing would for mankind never have to exist it, and the second best thing would be to die soon, basically confirming the absolute tragic nature of reality, the suffering and uh, pain of existence. And so that the idea here is that the Greeks were very in tune with this suffering of existence, and in order to make life bearable, they had to invent the Olympian gods. The Olympian gods would live life uh, gloriously and introduce through through this illusion, through this Apollonian illusion of the Olympian deities, would enable themselves to uh, find the joy in life and to and and to be pleased to be able to live in the in the sunlight of these greek gods he says specifically the same drive which called art into being as a completion and consummation of existence and as a guarantee of further existence gave rise also to that olympian realm which acted as a transfiguring mirror to the hellenic will the gods justified human life by living it themselves, the only satisfactory theodicy ever invented. To exist in the clear sunlight of such deities was now felt to be the highest good. And the only real grief suffered by Homeric man was inspired by the thought of leaving that sunlight. So he's saying that the creation of the gods provide essentially provided a joyful meaning for existence for the Greeks, more or less. So now I want to move on a little bit and get into more a more specific description of Apollo because I think this is really interesting here and I think that this begins to open up some political avenues of thought. So in this section he says, quote, "If the apotheosis of individuation is to be read in normative terms, we may infer that there is one norm only, the individual, or more precisely, the observance of the limits of the individual, sophrosyne. As a moral deity, Apollo demands self-control from his people, and in order to observe such self-control, a knowledge of self. And so we find that the aesthetic necessity of beauty is accompanied by the imperatives, know thyself, and nothing too much. Conversely, excess and hubris come to be regarded as the hostile spirits of the non-Apollonian sphere, hence as properties of the pre-Apollonian era, the age of titans, and the extra-Apollonian world, that is to say the world of the barbarians. It was because of his titanic love of man that Prometheus had to be devoured by vultures. It was because of his extravagant wisdom which succeeded in solving the riddle of the Sphinx, that Oedipus had to be cast into a whirlpool of crime. In this fashion does the Delphic god interpret the Greek past. So, end quote. I'm going to jump in here and, and finish this section in a moment, but I want to point out something here in this section that I find really interesting and relates back to some of the other things that we've seen. So, uh, the Oracle of Delphi uh, was was an oracle that was... The, the, the patron deity of whom was Apollo. And above the, the entrance to the, the cave or the temple, I'm not sure, I think it's a temple where the, where the Oracle of Delphi operates, uh, there are two slogans inscribed. And one of them says, Know thyself, effectively. And the other one says, um, Nothing in excess. Yeah, and so these two things actually relate to one another, and they relate to Apollo, because if Apollo is this, is the distinction of the individual and the separation of the individual from other 
entities and the, the drawing of boundaries of what an individual is and is not, then number one, you would say know yourself would be a recognition of your own individuality, a recognition and an observation of yourself as a separate entity from others, to having your own personality, your own hopes, dreams, etc. A, a particularity to yourself is, is implicit in the concept of knowing yourself. And the second thing would be um, nothing to excess or moderation in all things. And this is the concept of sophrosyne that he mentions. He says, more, he says uh, the, the, the norm of Apollo, the moral norm of Apollo is the individual or more precisely the observance of the limits of the individual or sophrosyne. So sophrosyne is knowing your boundaries. So this is where you say, okay, so if you're not going to go too far in any direction. If you're going to say nothing to excess, moderation in all things. So you're not going to go too far this way, or you're not going to go too far that way. And this sort of ties back to a sort of an Aristotelian approach that we saw in the Nicomachean Ethics. If you don't take anything to excess or to uh, deprivation, you don't go too far in any direction, um, then you kind of establish a place for yourself where you belong. Between this extreme and between that extreme, that is where you belong. That is, that is where you are. That's your sort of center. You might be centered in that way, right? But if you don't have a limit that you could go as far as you please in any direction, you could go to any extreme without limit, then in what way does that provide a, a, a grounding or a center to where and who you are. So the concept of sophrosyne and the establishment of boundaries and limitations upon an individual is a defining factor of that individual. So we see that sophrosyne, which we'll talk about more, we've talked about a little bit, as the concept of self-restraint and moderation, sophrosyne is a, is a fundamentally Apollonian concept, and it's a fundamentally individualistic concept concept as well. And uh, I think that's important as as we get into the sort of more, begin to get into the more political concepts. The next part that I want to read, uh, which is a continuation of that same thought process there, he says, quote, the effects of the Dionysiac spirit struck the Apollonian Greeks as titanic and barbaric. Yet they could not disguise from themselves the fact that that they were essentially akin to those deposed titans and heroes. They felt more than that. Their whole existence, with its temperate beauty, rested upon a base of suffering and knowledge which had been hidden from them until the reinstatement of Dionysus uncovered it once more. And lo and behold, Apollo found it impossible to live without Dionysus. The elements of titanism and barbarism turned out to be quite as fundamental as the Apollonian element. And now let us imagine how the ecstatic sounds of the Dionysiac rites penetrated ever more enticingly into that artificially restrained and discreet world of illusion. How this clamor established the whole outrageous gamut of nature, delight, grief, knowledge, even to the most piercing cry. And then let us imagine how the Apollonian artist with his thin, monotonous harp music must have sounded beside the demonic chant of the multitude. The muses presiding over the illusory arts paled before an art which enthusiastically told the truth, and the wisdom of Silenus cried, Woe! against the serene Olympians. The individual, with his limits and moderations, forgot himself in the Dionysiac vortex and became oblivious to the laws of Apollo. Indiscreet extravagance revealed itself as truth and contradiction, a delight born of pain spoke out of the bosom of nature. Wherever the Dionysiac voice was heard, the Apollonian norm seemed suspended or destroyed. Yet it is equally true that in those places where the first assault was withstood, the prestige and majesty of the Delphic god appeared more rigid and threatening than before. The only way I am able to view Doric art and the Doric state is as a perpetual military encampment of the Apollonian forces, an art so defiantly austere, so ringed about with fortifications, an education so military and exacting, a polity so ruthlessly cruel, could endure only in a continual state of resistance against the titanic and barbaric menace of Dionysus. 
end quote. So he talks about the Titans here a little bit. Now, basically, the Titans are the gods that came before the Olympian gods. So the Olympian gods are, are described by Nietzsche as being basically Apollonian gods. And the Titans would be considered more Dionysiac gods. These are gods of excess. These are the gods that strove aggressively toward various ends without recognizing uh, limitations. And so he's kind of setting up this conflict where the Dionysus is constrained by Apollo and then um, Dionysus inevitably returns and Apollo is overwhelmed or if Apollo, uh, if the Apollonian uh, worshippers set in and rejected the Dionysiac urge, they would become a sort of military encampment in their art. So... I think that this is a really interesting point because it seems to me, it begins to seem to me that to understand the political right, one has to understand it as a, in some ways, as a establishment of separation and distinction from one person to the, to the other. So we've got the, the typical uh, right-wing push toward individualism. Uh, you've got the concept of hierarchy, which depends upon an Apollonian separation. Uh, it's it's the ideology of distinction that would allow you know one person to rise above another, not demanding that everything be be equal and together all the time. And he talked a little bit previously about this Dionysian idea of oneness. And um, I think that on the political left, we can see more of the Dionysiac spirit, and on the right, more of the Apollonian spirit. So the Apollonians believe in borders and separation and definition and concreteness, and the Dionysiac believes in the, in the elimination of borders, the elimination of separation. So you see the elimination of the nation-state as a distinct entity and, the, and more of a globalist idea where the, the border between nations, the border between different groups, even the, the borders and boundaries that exist between men and women become dissolved. Anything that would distinguish one, that would define one inherently as this or that, becomes dissolved and any, anyone can be anything. The whole idea of, of border and boundary is dissolved by the ideology of the left and is reinforced by the ideology of the right, the, the separation and the distinction and the borders. So there's sort of a, it, to, to my eye, the more, I, the more I think about it, the more I see that the right is sort of Apollonian, is in a way could be considered like a cult of Apollo, and the left could be considered, in a, in a pagan sense, could be considered a sort of cult of Dionysus. And so then we get to how this conflict is resolved. Now, Nietzsche essentially claims that the conflict is resolved uh, artistically through the creation of Greek tragedy, uh, that the, the tragedy is sort of more than just art, it's sort of a religious ritual and binds the forces of Dionysus and Apollo. Uh, I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to get real into that sort of detail, but suffice to say that some form of synthesis would probably be necessary. Um, you know, can you have a situation where these two forces are at like perpetual, in a perpetual struggle to the death? Do like, you can't really have a world where Apollo rules supreme and everything becomes completely static and, and, and there's no change, there's no fluctuation, there's no blending, there's no creativity, there's no growth. It's just set in stone in this Apollonian stasis. Whereas a pure total supremacy of Dionysus would lead to the complete dissolution of any sort of civilization, civilization depending upon some forms of distinction between one person and the next. One, who does this? Who does that? What are, we, what are our social norms? What do you do versus not do? To have any sort of rule at all 
would depend upon the separation of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, and so on and so forth. So civilization depends upon Apollo, but uh, it can't go like no no society or even person can go completely get, be completely controlled by one of the or other of these forces. And so, how do you find that balance? Is it are you, are you going to have a society that continually fluctuates between the primacy of Apollonian forces and the primacy of Dionysiac forces? Or are you going to settle into a balance? Are you going to have a perfect balance? Now, it seems to me that in order for civilization to exist and not be in a state of constant revolution, you need to have a supremacy of Apollonian forces, but you don't want the absolute... Uh, domination of Apollonian forces in a society that's not healthy. So how we how we achieve this position where you know we we kind of recognize that civilization requires Apollo to be su superior over Dionysus. First of all, you know, even getting population at large to recognize Apollonian and Dionysiac tendencies within society is a challenge enough, but I think it's an interesting question. He talks a little bit about uh, the synthesis of these two forces uh, and in, in a bit of a political context. So in this section, he says, quote, only the Greeks can teach us what such a sudden miraculous birth of tragedy means to the heart and soul of a nation. The nation of the tragic mysteries fought the war with Persia, and the people who had conducted such a campaign had need of the rest restorative of tragedy. Who would have expected such strong, steady political feeling, such natural patriotism, such direct joy in combat of a nation which had undergone the most violent Dionysiac spasms for several generations? We know now that whenever a group has been deeply touched by Dionysiac emotions, the release from the bonds of individuation results in indifference or even hostility towards political instinct. On the other hand, Apollo, the founder of states, is also the genius of the Principium Individuationis, and neither commonwealth nor patriotism can subsist without an affirmation of individuality. The only path from orgiastic rites for a nation leads to Buddhism which, given its desire for nirvana, requires those rare moments of paroxysm that lift man beyond the confines of space, time, and individuation. These paroxysms, in turn, require a philosophy which teaches how the drab, intermediate phases can be triumphed over with the aid of the imagination. A nation, on the other hand, in which the political instincts hold absolute sway, necessarily moves toward extreme secularization, of which the most impressive but also most frightening example expression is the Roman Empire. Placed between India and Rome, and tempted to choose one solution or the other, the Greeks managed a classically pure third mode of existence. They could not maintain it for long themselves, but for that very reason it endures for all time. Though the favorites of the gods die young, they also live eternally in the company of the gods. Of what is noblest on earth we cannot reasonably expect, that it have the durable toughness of leather. The toughness, for instance, of the Roman national instinct is probably not one of the necessary predicates of perfection. Let us then ask what medicine it was that gave the Greeks in their greatest period, granted the extraordinary force of both their Dionysiac and political instincts, the ability not to exhaust themselves, either in ecstatic brooding or a restless bid for universal power and glory, but rather to attain that marvelous combination possessed by a noble wine, which at once heats the blood and induces meditation. In order to answer this question, we must think of tragedy, whose stimulating and purifying power affected the whole populace, and whose supreme value we shall not realize until we see it, as the Greeks did, as the embodiment of all prophylactic powers, reconciling the strongest and most precarious qualities of a nation, end quote. So really he's saying that, uh, that a, a purely Dionysiac uh, drive leads to the dissolution of the self, and that in that way he compares it to Buddhism, and the pure Apollonian leads to uh, 
secularization, as he des- describes it, and gives the example of the Roman Empire. Um, I'm not sure that's the appropriate term, secularization, but uh, it's a hardening and a militarism and a, and a focus on the political, away from the, the focus on uh, you know, the, the, the cultish rites and recognition of the gods and, and a, a, an experiential sort of uh, devotion to, to, uh, to the Dionysiac spirit. So he says the Greeks sort of found this third way of this blending through tragedy. Now, uh, I feel like we need to find some sort of a a, a reconciliation between Apollonian and Dionysiac forces in our own modern world. And I don't know as though Greek tragedy is the appropriate solution or even viable. I kind of doubt it. But I think that maybe the idea here is that through some sort of visionary art, the competing drives of society can be reconciled. I don't know. It's a question that we will have to further explore uh, in future episodes. But it's definitely something to get us thinking about. Uh, So then he talks a little bit more about how the Greek spirit can come into the modern world and... uh, and in that section, he says, quote, If one wants to try, whether he is an aesthetically responsive spectator or whether he belongs rather to the community of Socratic men, he may ask himself honestly with what emotion he responds to the miracle on the stage, whether he feels that his historical sense, trained to look everywhere for strict psychological causation, has been outraged whether he admits the miracle as a phenomenon that seems natural to child minds, but rather remote from himself, or whether he has some different sort of response. Depending on what answer he makes, he will be able to tell whether he has any understanding at all of myth, which, being a concentrated image of the world, an emblem of appearance, cannot dispense with the miracle. The chances are that almost every one of us, upon close examination, will have to admit that he is able to approach the once living reality of myth only by means of intellectual constructs. Yet every culture that has lost myth has lost, by the same token, its natural, healthy creativity. Only a horizon ringed about with myths can unify a culture. The forces of imagination and of Apollonian dream are saved only by myth from indiscriminate rambling. The images of myth must be the demonic guardians, ubiquitous but unnoticed, presiding over the growth of the child's mind and interpreting to the mature man his life and struggles. Nor does the commonwealth know any more potent, unwritten law than that mythic foundation which guarantees its union with religion and its basis in mythic conceptions. Over against this, let us consider abstract man stripped of myth abstract education, abstract mores, abstract law, abstract government, the random vagaries of the artistic imagination unchanneled by any native myth, a culture without any fixed and consecrated place of origin, condemned to exhaust all possibilities and feed miserably and parasitically on every culture under the sun. Here we have our present age, the result of a Socratism bent on the extermination of myth. Man, today, stripped of myth, stands famished among his pasts, and must dig frantically for roots, be it among the most remote antiquities. What does our great historical hunger signify, our clutching about us of countless other cultures, our consuming desire for knowledge, if not the loss of myth, of a mythic home, the mythic womb? Let us ask ourselves whether our feverish and frightening agitation is anything but the greedy grasping for food of a hungry man. And who would care to offer nourishment to a culture which, no matter how much it consumes, remains insatiable, and which converts the strongest and most wholesome food into history and criticism? If the German spirit were, like that of civilized France, indissolubly bound up with its culture, we might well despair of it. That oneness of her people with her culture, which for so long constituted France's great virtue and was the cause of her supremacy, might make us shudder as we look at her today and indeed congratulate ourselves 
that our own dubious culture has so far nothing in common with the noble core of our national character. All our hopes center on the fact that underneath the hectic movements of our civilization there dwells a marvelous ancient power, which arouses itself mightily only at certain grand moments, and then sinks back to dream again of the future. Out of this subsoil grew the German Reformation, in whose choral music the future strains of German music sounded for the first time. Luther's chorals, so inward, courageous, spiritual, and tender, are like the first Dionysiac cry from the thicket at the approach of spring. They are answered antiphonally by the sacred and exuberant procession of Dionysiac enthusiasts to whom we are indebted for German music, to whom we shall one day be indebted for the rebirth of German myth. I realize that I must now conduct the sympathetic reader to a mountain peak of lonely contemplation, where he will have few companions, and I would call out to him by way of encouragement that we must hold fast to our luminous guides, the Greeks. It is from them that we have borrowed, for the purification of our aesthetic notions, the twin divine images, each of whom governs his own realm, and whose commerce and mutual enhancement we have been able to guess at through the medium of Greek tragedy. We have seen how Greek tragedy declined through a curious sundering of the two sources that nourished it, a process which went hand in hand with the degeneration of the Greek national character, and which should make us consider how inextricably bound up with one another are art and the people, myth, and custom, tragedy in the commonwealth. The disappearance of tragedy also spelled the disappearance of myth. Heretofore, the Greeks had felt an instinctive need to relate their experience at one time to their myth, indeed to understand it only through that connection. In this way, even the immediate present appeared to them subspecie aeternititis, and in a certain sense as timeless. The commonwealth, as well as art, submerged itself in that timeless stream in order to find respite from the burden and avidity of the immediate moment. It may be claimed that a nation like an individual, is valuable only insofar as it is able to give to quotidian experience the stamp of the eternal. Only by so doing can it express its profound, if unconscious, conviction of the relativity of time and the metaphysical meaning of life. The opposite happens when a nation begins to view itself historically and to demolish the mythical bulwarks that surround it. The result is usually a definite secularization, a break with the unconscious metaphysic of its earlier mode of existence, with all the accompanying dismal moral consequences. End quote. So I'm going to close out with this last brief section here, uh, where he discusses the possibility of the return of tragedy, the rebirth of tragedy. He says, quote, Music and tragic myth are equally expressive of the Dionysiac talent of a nation and cannot be divorced from one another. Both have their origin in a realm of art which lies beyond the Apollonian. Both shed their transfiguring light on a region in whose rapt harmony, dissonance, and the horror of existence fade away in enchantment. Confident of their supreme powers, they both toy with the sting of displeasure, and by their toying, they both justify the existence of even the worst possible world. Thus, the Dionysiac element, as against the Apollonian, proves itself to be the eternal and original power of art, since it calls into being the entire world of phenomena. Yet in the midst of that world, a new transfiguring light is needed to catch and hold in life the stream of individual forms. If we could imagine an incarnation of dissonance, and what is man if not that? That dissonance, in order to endure life, would need a marvelous illusion to cover it with a veil of beauty. This is the proper artistic intention of Apollo, in whose name are gathered together all those countless illusions of fair semblance which at any moment make life worth living, and whet our appetite for the next moment. But only so much of the Dionysiac substratum of the universe may enter an individual consciousness as can be dealt with by the Apollonian transfiguration, so that these two prime agencies must develop in strict proportion, conformable to the laws of eternal justice. Whenever the Dionysiac forces become too obstreperous, as is the case today, we are safe in assuming that Apollo is close at hand, though wrapped in a cloud, and that the rich effects of his beauty will be witnessed by a later generation. 
the reader may intuit these effects if he has ever, though only in a dream, been carried back to the ancient Hellenic way of life. Walking beneath high, ionic peristyles, looking toward a horizon defined by pure and noble lines, seeing on either hand the glorified reflections of his shape, in gleaming marble, and all about him men moving solemnly or delicately, with harmonious sounds and rhythmic gestures. Would he not, then, overwhelmed by this steady stream of beauty, be forced to raise his hands to Apollo and call out, Blessed Greeks! How great must be your Dionysus if the Delic god thinks such enchantments necessary to cure you of your dithyrambic madness. To one so moved, an ancient Athenian with the august continence of Aeschylus might reply, But you should add, extraordinary stranger, what suffering must this race have endured in order to achieve such beauty? Now come with me to the tragedy, and let us sacrifice in the temple of both gods. End quote. So no real comment on that part. I just think it's interesting to imagine oneself uh, back in the Greek world appreciating all of the amazing accomplishments that they had. Nietzsche has a really interesting perspective on this, and it, it's very much bound in his theories of art and uh, the creation of tragedy and the interaction of these two forces in the binding of song and image um, and that's not really the point of my podcast, but I do think it's it's interesting to read about. So I, I recommend, especially if you want to come to an understanding of Nietzsche, uh, to pick this book up. And I'm going to close it out at that. Thank you all for tuning in today. I'll see you next time.